Hey guys, so it is yet another horribly stormy, rainy day. I spent the first part of the morning trying to figure out what was going on all around here because we had a massive storm come through in the middle of the night and our entire property is now streams and waterfalls and my wall, one of my walls that I put in over in the vegetable garden is at risk of actually eroding and washing out. Um, so I'm just basically in the house hiding because I don't know what else to do. So I'm gonna have all this footage of all of this mess on the Next Level Homestead video that's gonna come out on Saturday. So if you wanna head over there and uh, subscribe and put the notifications on and you'll get a notification when that comes out. But I did put out a post on our Facebook group and on our YouTube community page for Next Level Gardening asking you guys what your questions are because I, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to film outside. So I wanted to do some, uh, some question and answers from you. And if you have more, this is probably gonna be, uh, I know that we got so many and, and good ones too. Down in the comments, if you have more questions, I'm gonna probably split this up into two or three uh, videos. So let's just get started with the first one. Uh, curious if you've ever looked into worm farming, worm towers in the garden, is it worth the effort? I have not done it personally. I have started to, and then I was dissuaded from some other people who had done it and ended up with a mess and dead worms. Um, not to say I'll never do it, but I haven't so far. I feel like I get plenty of worms in my regular compost, so I don't know. Let me know down below in the comments if you guys have done it and if you think it's worth it. This is also another one of those videos where it's great to look in the comments because there's gonna be people answering questions differently than I might answer it. Okay, have you ever considered beekeeping? Absolutely. My best friend, Alan, is a beekeeper. Um, you guys probably saw him on the canning tomato video we did a couple of years ago. That video is worth it to watch just for the bloopers at the end. But yes, we are definitely looking into that, but I'm waiting until we actually have all of our flowers going for them to have something to eat. Could you tell me what to put in the planting hole for zucchini, bush beans, and okra? I'm assuming you mean fertilizer wise. I basically do the same thing on almost everything. I just throw a handful of Neptune's Harvest kelp meal and Neptune's Harvest uh, crab and lobster. You could also use blood meal, bone meal. Uh, there are very few things that I, I kind of do different than that. So, I mean, 90%, 99% of what I plant, that goes in the hole first including zucchini, bush beans, and okra. Best crops for low sun requirements, high shade, constant overcast. I did a video on that. I'll try to link it below, but there's not a lot of vegetables, especially summer vegetables, that will take hardly any shade. Um, cool season are more adapted to that because it's winter and there is less sun. So lettuces, greens, um, broccoli and cauliflower, actually at my old house in the winter, there was some trees blocking that half of, uh, the garden. And I would always get good production out of broccoli and cauliflower, root vegetables, potatoes, carrots, beets. Uh, those will all take some shade. Um, some herbs, cilantro likes some shade. Uh, but you know, we're talking either partial filtered shade for most of the day, or at least four hours of sun direct sun and then the rest shade. Um, that's probably your best, those are your best choices. When to pot up seedlings since it's that time of year? Someone was asking your feeding schedule with the various Neptune Harvest products. Pot up seedlings when they show the roots like they're coming out the bottom. You can also slide them out of their little cell and see if they're getting too crowded and it's mostly white roots you see. Definitely they need to be potted up at that point. There's a large window of you know when you can do that. Uh, I would say once the roots are coming out the bottom is your best bet because usually they come out the bottom before they start to wrap around the sides. As far as the Neptune's Harvest feeding schedule, we just talked about what I use at planting time. And then also there's a couple ways to do this. And I've usually only talked about one because I just wanna keep things simple. But uh, I use Neptune's Harvest liquid, the tomato and veg formula for everything, every two to three weeks. I'm not like, I don't have it in my calendar, but every two to three weeks, I will put that on there. Um, and then 
sometimes, not always, I will switch when it comes to the flowering stage, when the, the fruits start to grow, uh, I will change it then to the rose and flowering formula. Any of the perennials and the roses and things, they'll always get the rose and flowering formula. There's just a higher amount of phosphorus in there for the blooms and such. So, but if you only wanna buy one thing and, and you're not using more, you're just having to buy two different things. But if all you have and all you wanna buy is, is tomato and veg, that's gonna get you through perfectly. If you have leggy seedlings, can you repot them before the true leaves come on? So leggy seedlings, for those of you who are new, uh, is when you, your seedlings don't have enough light and they're stretching out to find more light. And usually that does happen before the true leaves come in. There's only a few plants that will for sure live after being leggy. Tomatoes are one. Um, peppers and eggplant will, but they're a close second. Uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Most other things, once they've stretched too far, they're not gonna work. Now you can always fill in around them with some more soil and just see what will happen. But I think, unfortunately, you're just better off starting over. Okay, I know I'm looking over here. I have to show you. These finches have been after this bird feeder. I just love watching them. Okay, I'll try to look at you instead of the birds, but ADHD, y'all. My seed starting soil and potting mix, both name brand with fertilizer added. I wonder what that is. They've both been terrible. Both became like a solid surface once watered in. I'm not sure how any roots grew. Then my plants seemed to yellow quickly, needing fertilizer to be added. What are some mixes that you recommend? And is there anything I can do to help the soil stay more loose? Thanks. I love both your channels. Very inspirational. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I use uh, Kellogg's raised bed mix. I use that in pots. I use that in raised beds. I know it's nationwide. I don't know about anywhere else because I've had people from all over saying that. I'm still looking over there. I'm sorry. I just need to close these blinds. Uh, I've had viewers from all over say they found it at Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, so if you can use that. Espoma also has a really good organic um, potting soil. So I would recommend one of those two brands. Have you ever tried core gardening and or a self-watering garden? What did you think? So I think core gardening, I might be wrong. I think that is where you either put compost, like finished compost or almost finished compost or kitchen scraps kind of buried within the bed and then put regular potting soil on top of that. So it has something to go down and draw from the roots. Uh, I've never done that. Self-watering garden, I did do a self-watering bed way back. Uh, my first blue turquoise bed at the last house was a self-watering bed raised up on legs, and it did okay. Uh, I think here in our area, we're a little bit dry, and if you don't really have that self-watering mechanism filling that all the time, then you might have a problem. If you live in more of a, a wet climate, you might be okay. I got rid of it and just went to straight raised beds. It was just easier for me. How do you motivate yourself to keep going on those days when you just don't have the energy and you'd rather just chill out? <sighs> well, um, <laughs> you just chill out, but chill out in the garden. I like right now, I mean, I want to be outside so bad. You know, I'm looking outside and there's just so much that needs to be done and filmed but I'm not able to. And so that's got me down right now. But as far as, you know, maybe midsummer when it's hot and there's bugs and you just don't like the look of things because things are just, you know, wilting or getting crispy or eaten. I mean, take a break. If, if you have things set up on drip where they will continue to be watered, you know, to force yourself to do it, it's not going to make you love it anymore and it's not going to make you any happier about the process. So when you need to take a break, you got to take a break unless it's your job like mine. And then you just got to push through. How long should strawberry roots be from soaking in water before you can plant them in the dirt and have the plant survive? Oh, so that's probably bare root. 
Um, I just soak mine while I'm getting the soil ready. So an hour would be great, but if you can get 30 minutes in, that's fine too. You're just trying to rehydrate them because you don't know how long they've been sitting on the shelves. And then she also asks, any chance of another meet and greet with a book signing? I hadn't even thought about it. Now the book is a year old this month, and um, but I guess you can still do stuff like that, right? I don't know. How many of you are between Los Angeles and San Diego that would come to one of those? Um, I mean, we had people fly in from Texas and stuff before. So I don't know. I, I would be open to it. I would have to find a, a place, but let me know what you think. Because yeah, YouTube gets a little bit lonely. I know there's so many of you out there, right on the other side, right there. But I still feel alone. It was, it was, so that, that book signing and meet and greet was just amazing. I loved it. At meeting you guys, there was like so many people there and um, we got to interact and talk about things. It was fun. So I would love to do it again. Maybe we'll work on that. Any sort of easy blockades to keep wild bunnies and squirrels out of a 12 inch raised bed. As far as rabbits, now I don't know what kind of rabbits you have. We have just cottontail rabbits here. Uh, and I've had a two foot tall chicken wire fence around the vegetable garden for about a year now. And I haven't had one rabbit get in. So that to me is the answer, unless you've got big beastly bunnies that can jump higher than that. They haven't been able to get in there here yet. Knock on wood. Um, as far as squirrels, uh, bird netting obviously will work, but I think what's easier than bird netting, I've talked about it before, is tool, T-U-L-L-E. And they use it for wedding dresses. And as I just was informed a couple videos ago, they use it for tutus. So if you want to keep your, the squirrels off of your bed, so I buy five foot wide rolls of it from the fabric store. And that's because my beds are four feet. And so if I staple them down at the ends, it gives the, or at the edges, it gives them kind of room for the plants to grow and push it up a little bit. And so that'll keep them off of your, your small plants. For the tomatoes, because they were eating all of my tomatoes last year, I just took little squares of tool and clothespins and I just wrapped each tomato in a square of tool with the clothespin on it and they did not eat any more tomatoes the entire year. I've heard it's because they don't like the way their claws feel in the tool fabric. There's a little, it's like a little tiny mesh. Whatever it, it is, it works. How far do you keep LED grow lights from seedlings? I put mine close and my seedlings growth was stunted and did not do well. Well, LEDs come in different strengths. So if it's like a fluorescent tube, like you put in a shop light and it's LED, that needs to be like two to three inches from the leaves of your seedlings. If it is a professional grow light, like I have my Viper Spectra, that's LED but it's much more powerful. And so those need to be, you know, about a foot, maybe 18 inches away, depending on the power that you have it turned to. Uh, so depending on which kind of LED light, Cindy, Cindy's been around a long time. I remember you have a beautiful bougainvillea in your old house. And I'm wondering if you could do a video on how to prune a bougainvillea someday. I should have done it back then because I had to prune that thing three times a year to keep it looking as good as it looked. That was one of the first things we planted at that house because we just wanted to cover up that part of that huge patio cover. However, uh, I'm going to be planting another one this spring in our Mediterranean garden to kind of grow across the roof of the house above the master bedroom doors. And so, yes, I will definitely make sure that I do a video on that and on the pruning. Good varieties of elderberry and blackberry to grow and raise beds. I've never grown elderberry before. Uh, blackberries, if they grow anything like blackberries, blackberries will grow anywhere. I mean, a raised bed would be a perfect place for blackberries and probably elderberries too. Question about onions. Should the greens be topped to increase bulb production? So the thought there is if you take off some of the top, it's going to put more energy into the bulb. And I've seen that both ways. Um, I had someone that told me they did it and they noticed no difference whatsoever. I think this year I will try that. I will try doing that and I'm going to try spooning an onion as well. And that is not cuddling up next to it. That is taking a spoon and 
once you see the bulb start to come out of the ground, take a spoon and just kind of remove the soil around that almost to halfway down. And supposedly that allows the, the onion to expand more. Now, I would think maybe if they're growing in clay, that was true, but I don't know if it would change anything if they're growing in some light, you know, potting mix. But we'll see. Maybe I'll try both of those things. I've got some onions that are probably ready for it right now. Is there a difference between sweet potato slips taken off the mother potato and slips cut from the vines and rooted in water? No, there's not. You can grow them, you can take them. I took some from my vines last year. I just cut off some of the vines and rooted them. That worked fine. Or you can take them off of the tuber itself. How to plant asparagus? Well, I just did a video on that. What was that, three weeks ago, four weeks ago? So I will link that down below. Try your aspirin tip with my tomatoes this year. How big should the plants be before the first spray? Um, I have a video on why we spray aspirin on our tomatoes, especially if you live in a humid climate. You need to take a look at that. I'll put a link down below. They can be pretty much any size. I probably start spraying mine when it's their foot tall, maybe. Um, but, you know, if you're setting them out, 8 to 12 inches tall? I mean, really, you can start them early. It's not going to hurt them. My question is during our very wet spring here in Northern California, is it okay to plant in overly wet soil if I gently make a hole large enough to place, place the two to three and a half foot root ball or inch root ball? Or will it cause problems with wet soil compacting? As long as you don't walk on it and smash it all in, that should be fine. What you might do is work some compost in to kind of dry it up, loosen it up a little bit. Or you could dig the little hole and put some compost in the hole like a little nest and then put the plant in. But um, yeah, I think you'll be okay. I left my five gallon bucket of compost tea outside over the winter. We had an extreme temp drop down to minus four with a wind chill of 20 below. <laughs> I can't even imagine. Is it still good to use or should I toss it and start a new one? Um, well, I don't know. I've heard that soil microbes do freeze at a certain point. I've also heard that they can kind of just hibernate. So I wouldn't throw it away. It's not going to hurt anything. But, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it to, to have the full benefit, you probably don't want it to have to go through that type of cold. If anybody out there lives in a really cold climate and know the answer to this question, please put it in the comments below. I'm in California zone 9B. Me too. And I appreciate your continual garden inspiration. Um, gardening is a true labor of love that presents us all with challenges, process improvements, and successes. In all your gardening years, what are you most proud of? Well, I think I would have to say just moving here and having been able to do everything that I've done. Um, I remember when I first moved in and I was so, I just, I looked and I was so overwhelmed because before we bought the house, it was all just dreaming and seeing all this property and, and what we can do with it. But then reality set in and I'm plunked up here in this large, for me, huge property. And I just really was overwhelmed. And then when I got to start working and found the soil to be baked solid clay um, to, to, to go from there to here in a year and a half. I'm, I'm probably most proud of that. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, as much as I did at the last house that I was proud of, uh, that's it. You know, just kind of being able to put my head down and just go forward that's what I'm proud of. So I'm going to stop right here. Uh, we'll have another video. I have, I've got a lot more questions and we're at 25 minutes before editing. So um, this will be a decent length video already. So if you have any more questions, please leave them down below. If you want to answer some questions down below, that would be great. I hope you guys are staying warm and dry wherever you are and that spring gets here quickly. See you next time.